Father God, I ask in your son in Jesus' name, continue to cover us in the blood. Continue to walk with us and keep us, Lord Jesus. Father God, we have had some family members in this church who have gone on, Lord, but let them know that their church members daily pray for them and they hurt. Daily pray for them in their spirit. Help us, Father God, to understand this moment. This moment is beyond what we could have ever imagined, Lord. But, Father God, this is what you chose for us to do in this time. Father God, this is why you have been, have embedded that spirit. So that when we can't be in fellowship with one another, we will understand how to learn to uphold one another in spirit and in truth. Father God, continue to bless us individually. Continue to bless us collectively, even if we're not together. These are many blessings I ask in your son Jesus' name, I pray. Stay with our sick. Stay with those who are hungry. Stay with those who are lonely in spirit. Stay with us, Father God, and cover us just because we are the Lord. You're the center of 
joy When I've lost my direction You're the compass for my way You're the fire and light When nights are long and cold In sadness You are the laughter Good morning. It's another day that the Lord has blessed us and we give him all the praise because he's worthy of all of our praise. Yes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how blessed and thank you for the glad tidings of great joy that we receive from you as your people. Thank you for Jesus and the joy and peace that floods the heart of all who believe in him, the rock of our salvation. Eternity is too short to praise and magnify your glorious name for all your goodness and love toward us and to all who are called by your name. For in you is the fullness of great joy. Help me to share this joy of knowing Jesus with all those who you place in my path. Mm -hmm. And I pray that throughout the world there may be many turning their lives to you for our salvation on this day mm -hmm. by grace through the faith and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that the great joy of the Lord will fill your people who worship virtually today. Give this Mount Zion church family and friends that overwhelming joy that will bring contentment during the troubled times. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength. Truly, you are my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. On this day, we invite you to come with us to the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. We'll be reading from the New Living a Translation. You find it, it reads, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. That's in the reading of God's word. On this day, on this day, just for a subject, we want to talk to you from these words. Let Jesus be the center of your joy. Let Jesus be the center of your joy. My brothers and sisters, in this life, we will have much trouble. For it was Jesus who said, I told you these things so you may have peace in me. In the world you will have much trouble. But take hope. I have power over the world. John 16, 13. James says to us who are struggling with life adversities to consider it an opportunity for great joy. You see, the difference between trouble and trial is all in how you consider your trials. The word consider literally means to press your mind down on something. It means that you put pressure on your options as well as your troubles to test which one will stand and which one will fall. The tense of the word convey a sense of urgency. We weigh our worries. We calculate our trials. We test them. We put pressure on them. We evaluate them. So that we can put our trials and our troubles into perspective. And if you are like most folks, when you face what when you're faced with the one that nags you, frightens you, and keeps you awake at night, you ask, why me? 
Why does this always happen to me? For most people, the why question hits the hardest, hurts the most, and linger the longest, even when the trial or the trouble is over. The book of James was written to people at a church who were experiencing a great deal of trouble. James wrote this book to Jewish believers to encourage them to endure and live bold Christ-like lives. James in a book, James is a book about a practical child Christ-like living that reflects a genuine faith that transforms lives. In chapter 1, James teaches believers to test their faith and but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 1 and 22. James encouraged believers to put their faith in action and to be servants of Jesus Christ. Chapters 2 and 3, James described the relationship between faith and works. He teaches that a person of faith without works demonstrate useless faith. What good is a person's faith if they do not present it to the world? A believer's good works are evidence of their faith in Jesus Christ. He also teaches that everyone is a sinner and that if one of the Ten Commandments are broken, then that person is guilty of breaking every one of them. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all, two to ten. In chapter four through five, James gives wise instruction to believers. He said, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse uh, four, uh, seven. A faithful believer will desire to follow hard after God in service, obedience, and prayer. In chapter 5, James stresses the weight and magnitude of prayer for every believer. To signify the importance of prayer, James writes in verse 13, If anyone among you suffer, let him pray. In 14, if anyone among you sick, let him call for the elder of the church and let them pray over him. In 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. In 16, confess your transgressions to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly. And in verse 18, and he prayed again. In verses 19 and 20, James expressed the magnitude of living faith in action, saying, Brethren, if anyone among you wander from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, since the letter of James deals with the practical aspects of living out a Christ-like life, if we have a faith that works, it will be seen by what we do and how we face trouble, how we treat people, how we talk, how we deal with transgressions in our lives, and how we pray. This message is about Jesus being the center of your joy. Your joy is not based on what is happening to you, but your joy is based on who is in you. John puts it this way by saying, you are God's little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. The subject, let Jesus be the center of your joy, recalls these words of a song that I heard some time ago. 
Jesus, you are the center of my joy. All that is good and perfect comes from you. You are the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. When I lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You are the fire and light when nights are long and cold. In sadness, you're the laughter and the shadow of all my fears. When I am all alone, your hand is there to hold. You are why I feel pleasure in the simple things of life. You are music in meadows and the stream, the voices of the children, my family, and my home. You are the source and finisher of my highest dream. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. These words depict the place where every believer must eventually come to if they want to constantly triumph over troubled times. Understanding that the only real joy in this life is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. According to John 10.10 10, from the voice, the thief approaches with mistress intent, looking to steal, slaughter, and destroy. I came to give life with joy and abundance. The worldwide English New Testament read, The thief comes on to steal the sheep and kill them and spoil them. I have come so that the people may live and that they may enjoy life to its fullest. During my former years, I often wonder how the old folks could give testimony after testimony about their lives and still exist, exhibit great joy when I knew that they were having much trouble. What I did not understand was they did not measure that joy by the circumstances, not their current condition, but they measured that joy by the relationship they had developed and their position with Jesus Christ. Granddaddy would preach, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalms 35. Those old folks live by the word of God. And I now understand why they could shout with great joy when times were hard. I now understand that they would, how they could say Jesus would work it out without understanding how he would do it. They had experience and a track record to see him work things out over and over again. So they were able to establish a state of great joy even when times were bad. Having this great joy did not stop them from the normal emotional response that everyone experienced. But they had the faith that God will make a way. So we want to examine what it means to have great joy and what it means for Jesus to be the center of your joy. The word center means the middle point. The point from which an activity or process is directed or on which it is focused. The center of something is the middle point of balance. In other words, it's the point where there is equilibrium, the point where everything else rotates around it. Now, when, tr when trouble of any kind come your way, and when you let Jesus be the center of your joy, you are saying, my great joy is achieved or found in Jesus, and that is not determined by the negative circumstances staring me in the face. When Jesus is the center of your joy, you've been able to declare as Job, man who was born of a woman, is of a few days and full of trouble. All the days of my heart service, I will wait till my change come. 
Joel 14, 1 and 14. In the text, James tells us right where we live. He says, let trouble become opportunities. Let your faith grow. Let your endurance develop. Let Jesus be the center of your joy. To me mean God is making you better through your troubles. So consider them an opportunity for great joy. Let trouble become an opportunity of great joy. But verse 2 reads, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for a great joy. The question is, how can a person consider trouble as an opportunity for a great joy? This is a remarkable command. We are to choose to be joyful in situations where joy will naturally be uh, some response that does not appear. When certain situations make you angry and you want to blame the Lord, James directs you to a healthier alternative. Great joy. Those who trust in the Lord ought to exhibit a dynamic difference a positive response to a difficult event of life. Our attitude is to be one of genuine rejoicing. This is not joyful anticipation for trials. Instead, it is joy during the trial. The joy is, ba is based on confidence in the outcome of the trial. It is the stabilizing realization that trials represent the possibility of growth. In context, most people are happy when they escape trial, but James encouraged us to have great joy in the face of trials. Paul, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, speaks to us in Philippians 4 and 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. James is not encouraging believers to pretend, pretend to be happy. Rejoicing goes beyond happiness. Happiness is centered on earthly consequences and how well things are going in your life. Joy centers on God and is present in your journey through the valley of life. The joy of the Lord is not the same as the joy of the world. The joy of the world is more of a temporary pleasure than joy. The world's joy is always nagging by some incompleteness, some lightness, some unfeeling things, some missing ingredient, some need still to be filled. There is not a completeness not a complete sense of assurance of confidence and satisfaction in the world. When Jesus is the center of your joy, that is joy divine. It possessed and is possessed and is given only by God. His roots are not in earthly or material things or cheap trials. It is the joy of the Holy Spirit, a joy based in the Lord. Joy does not depend on circumstances of happiness. Happiness depends on happiness, but joy that God implants in the believer heart overrides all, even the matter of life and death. We urge you to be joyful, not if we face trials, but when we face trials. Trials, problems, situation can be joy robbers if we lack the proper attitude. The troubles and trials we face, face can be hardship from without or temptation from within. A trouble may be a hard situation that tests a person's faith, such as persecution, a difficult moral choice, or a tragedy. The role of life is marked with many trials. Enduring one trial is not enough. God's purpose is aligned this process is to develop complete maturity in us. 
considering your troubles to be great joy comes from seeing life with God's perspective in mind. We may not be able to understand the specific reason for God to allow certain circumstances to crush us or to wear us down, but we can be confident that God's plan is for our good. We can be encouraged by the words of Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. What may look hopeless or impossible to us never is that way with God. Jesus tells us in Luke 18, 27, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Although the road of life is marked with many trials, Peter says to us in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if someone, something strange was happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will be able to have wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Therefore, we should not be surprised by the troubles of life because we are more or less guaranteed that they will happen. The question then becomes, not will trouble come our way, but what will we do when tr trouble do come? Will you allow the trouble to make you bitter or will you allow the trouble to make you better? Will trouble, will you allow trouble to rob your joy or will you allow trouble to increase your joy? Remember, joy is not happiness. Happiness is dependent upon circumstances. But joy is dependent upon God. Will we allow trouble to cause us to turn against God? Or will we agree with James, Peter, and Paul and rejoice in spite of our trouble? Happiness changed like the weather, but joy remained constant because it is dependent upon God who never ever changes. How can trouble be an opportunity for a great joy? James tells us it can. And number two, he says, let your faith grow. Verse three, James says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance have a chance to grow. Faith is testing. Although we tend to think of testing as a way to prove what we do not know or do not have, being tested ought to be seen as a positive attitude to prove what we can learn. The testing of your faith is a test that has a positive purpose. In this case, the trouble do not determine whether or not believers have faith, but rather the trouble strengthens believers by adding endurance to the faith that already present. Endurance and faith stretches out. It involves trusting God for the long duration. Solomon writes in Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you what path to take. Don't be impressed by your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bone. James, here in the text, is not questioning the faith of his readers. He assumed that they trust in Jesus Christ. He is not convicting people to believe, but he encouraged believers to remain faithful to the end. This means, first, that God will give the ability to endure patience. Secondly, endurance carry the ideal of discipline. Thirdly, 
Endurance means steadfast faithfulness. Paul makes a point in Romans 5 and 3 in saying we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. James knows that his reader's faith is real but it lacks maturity. We cannot really know our death until we see how we react under pressure. Precious diamonds being begin as a coal, subject to intense pressure over a period of time. Without pressure, coal remains coal. The testing of your faith is the combined pressure that life brings to bring on you. Endurance is like a precious gem as it tended to overcome the test of time. Endurance is not a passive submission to circumstances. It is a strong and active response to the difficult events of life. Standing on your feet as you face the storms of life. God tests our faith not to punish us, but rather to make us better. Peter says to us in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire, tested to be purified gold. Through your faith, it's far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through the trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. We need to look at trouble as a chance for our faith to grow. It is all in the attitude. If we begin to look at the difficulties in our life as a chance to grow, we'll probably lessen the stresses in our lives. What if in 10 of questioning God's love for us, we start asking God to show us what he's trying to accomplish in our life? Not only do trouble allow faith to grow, but it also help your endurance to develop. Verse 4, James says, so let us grow for when we, when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. It is not our nature to endure. When it comes to trials, we would rather escape a it and not have it in our lives. In fact, we would tend to do almost anything to avoid enduring a trial. Even if you have been seriously wounded in battle of faith, never stop fighting. James invites us to envision ourselves in a state of spiritual maturity. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you long for the fullness of God's presence in your life? If so, then you need to have a great joy when you face trials and tribulations, knowing that God will uh, work it out. The trials can be an opportunity for testing and developing you, so when it's all over, you will become more mature knowing that God is still with you. For those who have set in their heart to become Christ-like, it is a wonderful reason to let Jesus be the center of your joy. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the road to Calvary was an easy one? Did Jesus quit halfway up the hill? Did Peter when thrown in prison, give up? Did Paul, when he was beaten in prison, 
quick, left dead, shipwrecked, and bitten by a poison snake, did he give up? The answer to the question is no. They did not give up. They kept on getting up, moving forward, and pressing on. So I say to you, when trials come, keep pressing forward. Never forget that God has already said that I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Also never forget that the will of God will never call you to go through something that the grace of God cannot keep you. If you feel like giving up, and maybe you feel like God has abandoned you, again, always hold on to the words that God says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. If the devil has told you that all the troubles you are going through is proof that God do not love you, remember that God loved you so much that he sent his only son to die for you. Paul says to us in Romans 5 and 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. If you are going through trouble and you feel you cannot stand anymore, when you are in a spiritual battle, be sure to put on the armor of God. Just stand and God will see you through. God has not given up on you. God has not abandoned you. God loves you in the midst of your troubles. God tells us that these earthly troubles are only temporary setbacks to keep on pressing on and God will sustain you. God is making you better through troubles, so consider them an opportunity for a great joy. Let troubles become opportunities. Let your faith grow. Let your endurance develop. Consider these things. God has led you this far, and he's not going to leave you in the middle of the wilderness. God wants you to use your troubles to make your faith stronger. So hang on and enjoy the ride. God wants to use your trouble to open doors to help someone else who is going through troubles. So let him. While you are going through, you can have great joy when you let Jesus be the center of your joy. I believe as we hasten to this close, that it was Andre Crouch that penned, I have had many tears and sorrows. I have had questions for tomorrow. There have been many times I did not know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come to own and make me strong. I have been to a lot of places and I've seen millions of faces. But there was times that I felt so alone. But in my lonely hours, yes, those precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know that I was his own. That is the reason I say that through it all, through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I learned to trust in God. I learned to depend upon his word. So I thank God for the mountain. I thank him for the valley. I thank him for the storms he brought me through. But if I had never had a problem, I would never know that God could solve them. I would never know what faith in his word could do. That is the reason I say that through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. So to say to you as a go to my seat, let Jesus be the center of your way. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. For I know for myself, God's great joy is all that you need. He has a joy 
that will surpass all understanding. Trust him and never doubt it. Let Jesus be the center of your joy. On this day, if you are having trials and tribulations and you feel that you are all alone, I say to you, let Jesus be the center of your joy. And we invite you, if you're not part of the family of the believers, we invite you to come. Give your life to the one that has great joy. You can come by letter. Christian experience our candidate for baptism. All you have to do is to extend your hand to Jesus Christ and let him into your life. Give your life to him who for the joy of it went to Calvary's cross for you and for me. Now if him is able to keep you from falling, it was if you fall before his brother's single soul to the one who provides God of God, Savior to me, we give him praise and thank you for his great joy. In Jesus' name we are blessed. Amen. Oh,